good um, webinars, couple of webinars every month, you know, on very interesting topics. Yeah. These are topics that are very of interest for a lot of our our customers as well sure. as our prospects as well. Um, our main intention is to make sure that we we talk about a certain topic that helps you know all of our listeners. Um, right. We do have a lot of attendees here today um, attending these sessions. Um, usually, this is a one-hour uh, session. Uh, mm -hmm. We we have forty-five minutes time to talk about you know the topic that we have today, and then yep. we leave the last fifteen minutes for Q and A. No, that uh, sounds good. Yeah, quick update for everyone: this session is recorded. Um, so we will have a copy of this recording that we'll share with everyone. It's also available on our website. Um, at the same time, the session is also being live streamed on LinkedIn and Facebook right now. Um, again, without much delay, um, a quick introduction about uh, myself. Um, my name is Venkat Kulli. I'm the CEO here at Urwin. Uh, a little background about uh, Urwin for people who don't know who, what Urwin is. Urwin is pretty much uh, a recruiting platform that is used by most consulting and staffing companies um, across US, India, Singapore, UK right now. Uh, primarily, we also have, uh, we have an ATS, we have a CRM as well as a HR component at the same. So it's pretty much a single ERP to run all your staffing business right now. So um, again, without much delay, I'm gonna hand it, uh, pass it on to Mark to just do a brief introduction and then take it forward from there. Hey, Venkat, thanks very much for, for inviting me on this, um, <clears throat> in this webinar. Uh, my name is Mark Knowlton, the CEO and founder of TechScreen. Uh, we're the only SaaS platform that's used for technical evaluation purposes. And the product actually comes with formal industry certified training as well as twice a week live support. So it's a holistic solution. but. Um, but getting down to the basics, technical screening has been a passion of mine. From the time I started doing technical, deep technical interviews since the late 90s, and I've seen firsthand the impact it has, um, whether you're recruiting in your, in your interfacing with candidates or if you're, say, on the AE side and you're interfacing with managers to really qualify the requirement. And so I wanted to pick a topic that was of general interest, but there's something for both recruiters and AEs, because one of the challenges of having to do any sort of technical qualification is we're not engineers, right? And, 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 but there's no reason that a person in either of those roles can't effectively engage with a technical audience if they had the proper guidance and approach and of course, some you know some knowledge in how to have these conversations, what to look for, uh, what red flags might fly in the course of you speaking to a, a technical counterpart. And what I hope to accomplish today is to give you some some guidance and some approaches to how you can engage so you, you can walk away from a conversation with your own gut level confidence that you know you're representing somebody who is who they say they are, who has the knowledge that their, their CV reflects and that you're more likely to get a good outcome because you've got your own internal confidence that this person really knows what they're talking about. And so um, I'm gonna just uh, share my screen. I've got a little deck here. Let's go to slideshow mode. Okay, we'll get that down there. So screening for tech for non-technical. And just in full disclosure, I, I, I want to um, be totally transparent and, and I'm gonna show you something from my past that you don't have to be technical to get technology. So this was from my own resume. As you can see, I was a career changer. I entered the workspace in the newspaper industry. I was a journalism major who was allergic to math. Okay, so, so I've been mistaken as a developer many, many times over the years based on the questions I would ask candidates. They just assumed I wrote code, but this is full disclosure, putting it right up there. I started my work world as a writer and editor of the newspaper racket. So I wanna give you hope. You actually had the ability to engage on a technical basis 
without having been an engineer yourself. And so to get things rolling, this is a question, if you're familiar with the Q&A site Quora, they posed this question quite a few years ago. Why is it hard to connect with software engineers when you're a recruiter? And so there, I'm sure you can imagine, there were tons and tons of responses. But the one that stood out the most to me um, was this response. By understanding technology better, recruiters would add more value both to the companies they're recruiting for and the people they're recruiting. And this was offered by a guy named John Bishke. He is the founder and CEO of a software company that's actually, you know, this is a guy who has his entire future bet on the success of the recruiting space because Intello is a leading edge sourcing tool. And so when, when John offers up this, this suggestion, he's doing it from a firsthand perspective as a technologist, but someone who wants to see recruiters do well, be effective at their jobs. And the underlying message that he's bringing here is all about technical engagement. You know, it, it's, you know, they, they know people, you know, recruiters and AEs aren't coders, but you don't have to be a coder to engage in the kind of conversation that's gonna let you extract from them, you know, their internal knowledge, what they know, what they understand. And, and this is what we're gonna talk about today. So the, the key to, you know, really getting clarity starts with understanding the context, okay? Now, you do not need to understand code in order to determine whether a developer is the right level of competence. Uh, and this is, this is a theme, you're gonna hear me, I am gonna beat this one like a bass drum. Buzzwords are your enemy. Uh, they have their place, don't get me wrong, okay? But, but what I've seen too frequently, recruiters rely on buzzwords far too much. They make them the basis of a lot of their search strings using Boolean, and they're just as likely to produce a false positive as to produce the, the desired results. So all I'm saying in a cautionary way is be very, very careful about how you make use of the buzzwords from a job spec. And your goal when you're talking to a candidate should be to first understand the substance of the tasks they're performing and not necessarily the nature of a technical tool. Now, having said that, if you can give a good description of a body of work your candidate produced, and you're also familiar with how they made use of a tool in order to execute that, fantastic. But the point I'm trying to drive home here is that don't go digging into the entire technical environment and what made up their stack if you can't first, with clarity, explain a deliverable, a work artifact, of what your candidate did. So focus on what they have done. Be able to describe it like you're telling a story that has a beginning, a middle, and an end, um, and not necessarily the technical terms and the alphabet soup of um, acronyms, et cetera, they, they put in, into their resume. And so what's the key to cracking the developer's code, right? So what does this candidate do? You know, what's the focus of the deliverables? You always want to look to see, have them describe some tangible thing they produced, you, you know, because when you're talking to a manager, and it doesn't matter whether you're a recruiter talking to the AE or the AE talking to the manager, they're looking to know what have they built? How does it relate to what we're actually working on? You know, because... Uh, it's not enough to just say, I'm looking for a .NET developer, right? You know, because if you're looking for a .NET developer who can design a system that is meant to validate financial transactions, because it can automatically look as like, okay, this, this equity is being requested, it's trading at, at Y value, you have 
you know, Z amount of dollars in your account, can we reconcile this transaction or do we need to do a rollback, right? And so someone who understands the complexity of all those moving parts is very, very specific versus someone who just has, has .NET on their resume for the appropriate amount of years. And it's essential that they can explain the business purpose of what they were working on. In fact, very often, um, before I would even get into the real nuts and bolts of a deeply technical interview, I, most of the time I'll actually start off by saying, okay, before we dig into the details, walk me through a project. It doesn't have to be your most recent one, but give me, talk about something that you were involved from beginning to end. So you had deep visibility into the requirements. What are we building? What's the use case that we're dealing with right now? What pain or problem exists right now? And how are we removing this problem? And what does it mean for the business when this problem goes away? So if you can't walk through a detailed example of that um, work that your candidate did, you still have work to do. Because at the end of the day, they're not just hiring someone who has a bunch of skills on a resume. They need someone who can perform a very specific set of tasks that have very precise type of deliverables. And you, you have to be able to articulate the why this person is a fit because the more you, you uh, rely on a manager just quickly scanning a resume, you are leaving your potential placement up for the vagaries of whatever biases the manager may have um, you may be a victim of whatever assumptions they make based on what they see or don't see on a resume. And so by putting a lot of effort into articulating in precise detail how the work they've done maps to the work you were going to ask them to do is going to help pull the manager away from being locked in on the resume. Because we all know the manager is going to read the resume maybe between five and 10 seconds before they decide if they're going to keep reading, make it easy for them by leading with the work that they've produced. And the other thing to keep in mind, when you're talking to the candidates, make sure they can effectively explain complexity in a way that makes it easy to follow. Because not only do you want to know for yourself, but you also have to think about this candidate in a technical environment. Like I one time years ago when I was um, consulting uh, at the MathWorks, we were doing a debrief for a candidate who, you know, was, was solid technically. Um, but one of the reasons they, they shot this person down was they said, I'm trying to picture this guy explain something in a standup. And he is so imprecise, he's going to lose everybody in 10 seconds. So gauge how effectively they explain something and rely less on, oh, well, they've been doing .NET for seven years. They have to be an expert. Make sure they can explain advanced technical concepts, advanced technical projects in a way that actually makes sense for a non-technical person to follow and keep up with them. So I want to introduce some, this is something I actually um, came up with about 20 years ago in a white paper, the subject verb object methodology. And what this is all about is when you're reading the resume, there are a gazillion buzzwords and they often can cause more problems than, than, than provide clarity. And, and so this methodology was designed specifically to ignore or step over the technical terms because you want to be able to get to the, okay, what does this person do? How would I describe the kind of work this candidate has been doing recently? And do it by avoiding or not getting sucked into the ocean of buzzwords that may be you know, all over a resume. And let me, let me give you an example of what that looks like. Okay, so this is actually content from a resume of a good friend of mine. The, the resume content is a bit dated, as you'll see in, in, in a moment. But he did very, he's a, a heavy duty middle tier guy. He's been at Microsoft for 
you know, over probably 15, 20 years. All right. And his resumes can be very complex, but if you apply the subject verb methodology, um, subject verb object methodology, and just looked at the subject verb and object of the sentence, design documented database schema for web-based job board system. Oh, oh, okay. okay. I can get my head around that. He, he worked for this dot-com or a company called refer.com. And that's what he did. You know, he designed and implemented classes and templates for com components. It's like, okay, he's building middle, middle tier business logic on this system. All right, I can, I can get my head around that. Design implemented abstraction layer object for, you know, active uh, data objects. Implemented com components and database stored procedures. So if you simply attack the content of a resume and apply this methodology, you can just dig right into what they actually are doing and get your head around it because you want to be able to articulate whether you're speaking verbally, whether you're just writing an email. This is going to help you stay focused on only those elements that actually extract the meaning of the work that they're trying to relate to. Uh, I know a lot of times we're so worried about getting the submittal and being the first to submit. And this, this exercise is designed to help make it easier for you to quickly dive in and make heads or tails of what this person's actually doing in their day to day. And getting distracted by the buzzwords, it's so easy. It's so easy to do. And so this is a, a, another actual resume of somebody I've encountered in the past. And you can see they have no shortage of, of buzzwords, okay? Now, there, there are very few absolutes in, in this space, but I wanna point out a couple of things because I'm seeing some red flags here, all right? The first red flag I'm seeing He's talking about Java 1.6, okay? Now, Java 8 came out a couple of years ago and there were some paradigm shifts in the language. Um, so this is something that would really raise a flag for me. He's like, okay, um, he's talking about software architecture design, object oriented analysis, and he's working on an older version of Java. And then you look at some web logic and web sphere. It's like, hmm, these are pretty dated too. Now, by no means am I suggesting in any way that you need to become a disciple of what's the latest version of every single app server or container, etc. That's not my point at all. But I'm just trying to plant the seed that when you're looking at somebody's resume and if you have been historically depend rely would rely on the buzzwords to tell the story, just understand that's a two-edged sword. And when you see like Windows 2K, XP Vista, you know, um, Tomcat 7, JBoss 3.2, um, SQL Server 2000, obviously these resumes are older, been a long time since I've just done recruiting as my, you know, as my day to day. But again, don't be fooled just because you see a lot of the right terms here. It doesn't mean that they're they're current, but let's apply the subject verb object to somebody's CV. Now, the first thing I noticed here, now, if anyone's familiar with Sapien Corporation, highly regarded uh, consulting firm, they're one of the companies who sort of pioneered the fixed cost, fixed time model, and are generally very well regarded. So when you see a name like Sapien, you could have two default reactions. Number one, really good company, very good reputation. They technically have to be very sound because they, these guys don't hire fools. And in addition, because they do this kind of consulting, this person's probably very well-spoken. They have good client-facing skills. So you're thinking, wow, this guy's going to the top of my call list. And then you see the title, technical architect. You're like, okay, this, this is looking so good. I can, I can just put this placement on the board. Let's apply our methodology and see what it reveals. Okay, work globally distributed team to deliver initiatives, streamline back office messaging systems, back office operations. Oh, okay. Doesn't seem to be anything really remarkable going on here, but let's, let's press on. My roles coordinate activities across 
on thoughts run to a team, track stories and tasks, provide business and technical oversight to QA teams. Huh. Um, it looks more like he's doing work that might fall on the plate of a business analyst uh, or a project manager. The work he's describing here isn't lining up with a code slinging architect who can design and, and build and deploy complex OO based systems, which the first page of his resume suggested. And so you can see when you dig in to just, and this is just his you know, one paragraph when he outlined his responsibilities. Subject verb object methodology just revealed that, okay, you might be really, really good. The work I'm seeing sounds like it could be done by a business analyst. So I'm not seeing, this is not screaming technical architect to me. Now, might the guy be a really solid developer? Absolutely. But taking this approach is going to peel back the layers of the onion that you need to know about this. Because if you want to represent this person, you have to have real clarity on what has he actually done. And the subject verb object methodology is just a great way to really get to the truth. So I'm going to explain. Uh, Venkat, uh, I have a quick question. You know, yes, you, please. Okay. I wanted to uh, make sure we understand. So one of the, you know, in an example that you showed earlier, you had mentioned that, you know, the description was more of a business analyst, right? Yep. Um, one of the challenges that we've seen and our customers have seen is that, you know, when 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 uh, candidates present their resumes, right, um, mm -hmm. not everyone is good at it, right? So they probably uh, are technically very smart, but they don't know how to really build a good resume. You know, that's mm -hmm. one thing that we've seen many times, right? Sure. Um, so in this scenario, how do you make sure you find the right candidate? Um, and how do you make sure he's the right fit for the right role? Uh, can you just give us some of your suggestions in a scenario like that? Exactly. So, so the presumption of this question, then, Kat, is that you have a very thorough understanding of a set of requirements for which you are sourcing. And so what I would do is say, OK, so I, I can see the work you've described. You know, in this project, you would be on a team and you'd be asked to perform the following things. Can you describe a project? where you performed a lot of those tasks and tell me about them. And, and right. so, um, because a, a resume is obviously a static document, but I would seek to draw the candidate into a conversation where they have to map something they've done with the set of requirements that are in front of you, uh, because those obviously were not, if you were looking for somebody who could design an entire complex system and be one of the people who writing the codes while they handed out some of the pieces to, to other members of the team, I encourage them to describe things that they've done to map to that. But um, what I was trying to do, illustrate there is by simply applying that, that quick agile methodology, you can uncover what would have been, you know, very likely a false positive, someone who you assumed based on all the buzzwords, based on the title and the, and the company they worked for, that they were, you know, an A plus candidate. But, you know, it's, it's, it's worth digging in a little bit or a um, bit more on what have they actually done? What have they actually described? And have these actions mapped to a set of uh, deliverables and competencies that will be tested if they were put into that role. Right. And so, one of the things I want to do here, uh, folks, is I want to give you some examples of some technical explanations so you have both a better understanding of some of these from a conceptual perspective, uh, as well as some guidance on, like saying, asking an open-ended question that has a technical nature and without being technical, how you could personally interpret the efficacy, like how well, how effectively did they explain them things, explain themselves. So I want to uh, give you some examples of questions you can ask coming away from this presentation that you could ask a candidate 
and you would have your own internal sense of whether the candidate really understood um, what they were talking about. And, and the first one here is actually a subject that's near and dear to my heart is object orientation. And I find that the best way to explain an advanced technical concept is to relate it to something the average person could easily get their head around. And in this case, I'm choosing a house, something that everyone should be familiar with. And a house is um, a complex system that has a lot of different components to it. Um, it has you know, different um, types of machinery in it, different types of objects in it, et cetera. And it's all part of one big giant ecosystem, all right? And so we're going to call this house um, a base class or a super class in using object-oriented uh, terminology. And so beneath this super class, now the way object orientation works, the principle is to, you know, this came along first in, in, in the 60s and really became popular in the 80s as systems got more and more complex, that there are certain types of activities or transactions that are common to complex systems, no matter what your industry, and say, let's try to define these things generically and then reuse it so we're not reinventing the wheel. I just want to see here, make sure I'm not missing anything in the chat. And so we'll start with the super class, the description of a vast amount of different complex systems that are defined at the most generic level. And beneath that, we're going to come up with different types of specific um, objects inside of a house system. There's furniture types, there are infrastructure types, there are appliance types, there are adornment types. And so we're going to refer to these specific subsets of this superclass, and we're going to call them abstract classes. They have some basic level of specificity, but they're still extremely generic and, and don't have any sort of um, specific types of implementation. But from there, we can, because furniture is very different from in infrastructure, which is very different from appliances and very different from adornments, they each have their own sort of generic set of instructions that describe what each of these abstract classes are. And we'll be able to derive further uh, specificity underneath each one. And so under furniture objects, there's different types of furniture objects. There's seated types, there's storage types, there's platform types, different types of infrastructure. There's walls, there's wires, there's pipes, different types of appliances, there's kitchen and bathroom. And then there's different types of adornments. We have drapes, we have rugs, we have clothes, okay? And so these um, you could describe as derived classes. Um, and note that in each case, a super class, an abstract class, and a derived class, those terms all refer to something that has some type of definition, but it's not specific. Sometimes people ask me, what's the difference between a class and an object? Because it all sounds like interchangeable terms. Well, I'm about to show you the difference between a class and an object. So there's many different types of seated um, furnitures. There's an easy chair, there's a love seat, there's a sofa, there's wooden chairs, different types of storage um, furniture, bureaus, armoires, hope chests, jewelry box, platforms. And so when you look at the uh, derivation of these things, different types of pipes, kitchen appliances, bathroom appliances, these are all objects. And what makes them objects, this is an actual concrete implementation of something that exists in the world. And so you now can go and talk to any developer and you can ask them, hey, what's the difference between a class and an object? Now that you actually understand the nuance, the difference, you're gonna be able to knock out any person who gives you a bogus answer. You know why? Because now you have that knowledge internally. You own that knowledge. You know now that a class is a, is a loosely defined generic blueprint that sort of describes the attributes or processes 
uh, or abilities of this class, whether it's an abstract class or a derived class, but it's just a contract, it's a blueprint. It's not specific, like a kitchen table. That's the buck ends there. You can't further derive from that. And so ask, ask a candidate, hey, what's the difference between a class and an object? So number one, do you not only want to make sure that they know the answer, right? But you also want to know is like, how effectively can they explain it? Try to, try to picture your candidate explaining this answer to your Aunt Betty, who, whose technical skills stop at being able to make a microwave work. All right, so this is, now you're not gonna become an O expert, but this is a good example of how you could ask a simple question and get your own comfortable sense of the candidate actually knowing what the heck they're talking about. Another example. Uh, Mark, uh, this yes. is a good, uh, quick, again, a quick question on that. Um, yes. I know you mentioned a lot about, uh, you know, classes here, you know, um, mm -hmm. In this scenario, you know, I do understand the concepts right now of a class and an object, but relative to when we do look at these technologies that are out there and the amount of technical resources that are there, you know, some have mm -hmm. Java, .NET, you know, yep. DevOps and, you know, SAPs and Oracles and all these other skills, right? Um, but how do I, you know, when we go and, for example, ask them a question about difference between a class and object, that's not very relevant for someone who's not doing it day in and day out, right? Uh, but uh, I know this is specific, but are there any generic questions that we can ask uh, to the potential candidate, which will help us evaluate whether he's a right fit or not? Uh, can you give us some examples there? Yep, yeah, well, actually, I was just about to. I was just about oh. to, staying on the O paradigm. But this was, this was just, oh, um, the, the objective of this slide was to give a very high level uh, overview describing like this is the general principle of how OO works right and the next question now of course .NET or Java has some very very specific thing but there are certain realities or truths that any developer who is working with an object-oriented language should be able to answer and the next slide actually gives you that specifically okay. and right. so <clears throat> So I'm sure that everyone's heard of the expression polymorphism, okay, an object-oriented term. Now, if you can go look it up in a dictionary, it's gonna say, oh, it's derived from the Greek term, which means many faces. Uh, but let me explain from a layman's perspective what polymorphism is. So again, so polymorphism, it's a way for you to reuse a set of instructions in multiple lower classes without having to rewrite the set of instructions. So let's say we have an object we're gonna call animal. Right, And this animal object has a very generic description. It describes some creature. It has limbs, it has organs that are come inside of an exterior sheath. It can eat, can move around, it reproduces, it can see and hear, right? Now, let's say you want to create uh, different types of animals and you don't want to have to reinvent the wheel each time you want to get a different animal. So let's let each object um, inherit the generic properties that describe you know, an animal, and but you want different types. So in this case, you, um, you precisely describe the attributes of a horse, but you borrow from the generic descriptions of it has four legs, it has organs, it can make little animals, et cetera, et cetera. And then maybe you'd like to also have a bird, maybe you'd like to have a fish. Now, this animal has to have the ability to move around. So we're gonna have a method called motion. And motion is going to generically describe the activity. Well, the way this animal gets around, it has its legs and extremities, and it's going to extend and retract them to achieve locomotion. And so the polymorphism is when you take a method name and you implement that in a lower class. So it's the same method name, but there's a different implementation. So we're going to take the generic set of descriptions that describe how this animal moves around and we're gonna apply it in a lower class. So we, when we take the motion method and implement it in horse, we get gallop, in bird, we get fly, and in fish, we get swim. So you could ask any candidate who's using object-oriented languages, no matter what the language is, it could be Java, it could be C++, it could be .NET, it could be Python, it doesn't matter and you ask them to define polymorphism, 
they need to be giving you something that's awfully darn close to this, or you know that they're they're um, they're not for real. <clears throat> so here's a great question that I like to ask that's completely fair. It is non-technical specific, but it's going to give you insight into whether this person has the orientation that you're looking for. So let's say your candidate has been asked to design an e-commerce system from scratch, all right? Ton of complexity. And there's a lot that goes into this. So the guidance I would give you, and now, now keep in mind, there's no one silver bullet answer to a question like this, but I wanna walk you through some things to expect, some things to look for. And I would start out by saying to the candidate, I want you to give me every single question you would ask before you even thought about sitting down to design or even write any code. Some of the things that you're gonna to wanna to look for, how much do they focus on the actual business process, the inputs and the outputs? Did they start with, you know, do you have an e-commerce system already? You know, how much are you selling? What, you know, and how are you fulfilling this business process today? Are we extending an existing process, improving a uh, system? You know, did, did, are we enhancing an existing e-commerce system? Or are we going to build this thing, you know, from the ground up with, you know, with having nothing else in place, you know, and can they explain a detailed workflow of the entire application in a, in a round trip that describes, okay, user comes to site, then it takes this action, then it places this order, and then can they actually walk um, somebody else through the entire process front to back of what actually happens when this company sells one of its widgets? And then they have to talk about what kind of integrations they need to support. You know, are they tied into, um, you know, some sort of um, fulfillment um, application, some ERP application, so they're keeping track of their inventory. And maybe when they have uh, hit a certain threshold by there's only this many of these widgets left, let's automatically order another one. You know, do they, are they already tied into existing suppliers as part of a bigger supply chain? You know, they need to be digging into this stuff uh, before they even think about designing. They, and then, then you have the huge black hole of security. How are they talking about the security problems and, and the, the things that they need to pay attention to? Or a huge, huge, huge red flag. Did they just jump into talking about the stack almost immediately? Let me tell you something from experience. If you ask a candidate a question like this, that's looking for them say, hey, list the questions you would ask before you'd even write any code. And they're starting to talk about the stack. I'm telling you, run. I don't care what the resume says. I don't care how good are the companies, the reps of the companies on the resume were. I don't care what college they went to. If you have a guy or, or, or anybody who's been asked this question and they need to design it and they start talking about the stack, that is a massive red flag because they're not thinking about the business process. What task does this system have to fulfill in order to meet some business objective? And it's amateur hour if they start talking about the stack, you know, right, right away without defining all of this backend complexity. This is another question I Absolutely. I have gotten so much mileage out of this question. Um, it, it's remarkable. And again, it's language and platform and technology neutral. So the question I would ask, I present a scenario. Okay, so you got a web application in production, users picking some values in the UI and they hit submit. But instead of getting a return result page sent back to them, the application just hangs and it doesn't do anything. So walk me through everything you would dig into to uncover the problem. And we'll start by establishing the fact that we can rule out the network and the hardware. We know they are fine and they are absolutely not the problem at hand here. Here are the types of things you should expect to hear your candidates say. Okay, make sure the button recorded the click. Okay, there's a good start. 
open up Firebug, maybe there's some kind of browser issue happening that's getting in the way. You know, checking the application logs, make sure the query reaches the database. Now, there's again, there's no absolutes here, but I, I am telling you with a certainty, if you ask a question like this and your candidate is not going to the application logs, no further than like the third thing they would think of, that's a flag because the application logs are going to give you an ocean of information. There's so much detail that you could dig into and uncover and, and things you could rule out. So if they're not saying to dig in the logs, that is a massive problem. Maybe some other users is performing a really heavy query, but it happened at the same time and you sort of got left out in, in the cold, right? Uh, maybe there's an insufficient number of connection pools available. Um, maybe your query timed out waiting for someone else's job to finish. You know, they might say, okay, there's a deadlock, meaning when two entities are trying to access the same resource at identical time and you just happen to lose out. You know, there could be the improper use of cursors or indexes or temp tables. You know, there's too much data normalization that's slowing things down. Maybe they didn't realize they were doing full table scans and they were wasting a lot of time. Maybe there's too many um, badly written queries or queries and joins that are just needlessly complicated. Uh, maybe you would use, say, ex explain plan and break a long, complex query down into pieces, and maybe you test individual parts of the query to see if there's a problem in one of the strings. But these are the kinds of things you would want and expect to hear from this kind of open-ended question. And I would love to get feedback, and I'll follow up with, with Venkat and his team, to have somebody ask a question like this and see what kind of results they get. You know, breaking down the parts of the software development life cycle. Now, again, no absolutes, but this is meant to serve as kind of guidance of what to expect. So like to ask the question, so, okay, if you take all the parts of the SDLC, what percentage of your time are you gonna spend in each of these sections? Now, gathering requirements, probably 10 to 15%, right? Uh, um, Mark, a quick yes. question. Oh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Again, but, um, I just want to make sure I know we have another 15, 20 minutes, but yep. if anyone has any questions um, in, in the, on the Zoom, there is a Q&A section. Please go ahead and enter in your questions. So in the last 15 minutes, uh, we will uh, we can give you more answers. Mark can sh share okay. his thoughts yep. on that. So please, it, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yep. Okay, and so on the requirement, it's, it's critical you set aside enough time to uh, capture, you know, the complexity there. And so you're going to, you know, you're going to want to see them list, they're going to spend between 10 and 15% of the time on requirements. Then you have analysis. And again, you need the proper time to assess all the dependencies and all and really make sure you understand the business processes, um, and maybe integrations that need to happen. So you're going to want to see, they're going to put at least 15 to 20% uh, of their time on the analysis piece. And then we have design. This is a critical stage where you have to account for all of the problems, the pitfalls, and you really understand everything that needs to be built. And you're going to want your candidate to say, you're going to spend 30 to 40% of your time here. And then you have development. Now, this is where you really can uncover someone who's a cowboy and someone who's a professional. Because if you've done all of the appropriate planning, you're actually going to need to spend less of your time actually writing code. So you're hoping that your candidate's going to say only 10 to 20% of their time is going to be spent on development. And then testing, again, the real professional knows that you always have to leave a little bit extra time for those contingencies that are going to happen that no one expects. So 15 to 20% on, on testing. Now, this, again, is not an absolute, but it gives you at least a rough framework for you going to ask a question of a technical person that's going to give you insight and clarity to how they think about their job, how they approach their job, and to whether or not you think that they are got the right orientation or if they're just going to say, I'm going to spend minimal time on uh, requirements, I'm just going to get right into coding. Big problem. And then what's the most complex thing you've ever built, right? So what made us so complex? What assumptions are you making? You, you want to get a sense of if they describe a system that... Um, that um, I don't know, help send notifications when a stock price hit a certain threshold. It's like, okay, that's a useful thing, but that's what you consider complex. 
wow, I guess we think complex they have different definitions. You know, how do they approach design? Did they propose a solution before they understood the problems and the objectives? You know, in what level of granularity can they actually describe a business process? Did they address security? Can I, did they talk about their different risks? Um, again, did they deal, did they address concurrency and scale? You know, um, that's a huge, huge factor in, in designing a complex system. Did they talk about the integration with uh, third party systems? And, and again, you don't have to understand the nuts and bolts of how they did all these things, but these are fair questions you can ask anyone. So you get your own gut level confidence that they know what they're talking about. And so this is something I, I added in. Um, if anyone's heard the expression garbage collection, I wanted you to walk away with being able to talk to a developer and actually being able to ask them a question like this, how, how does garbage collection work in Java? So the air traffic controller is kind of like the Java virtual machine in Java, right? And so you have the terminal, you have the planes, you have the tower. And in planes, consider planes like object. Objects are assigned um, a, a very specific task and objects need resources to complete their tasks. So think of planes use fuel the way an application uses memory. Memory is assigned to an object so it can perform its assigned task. In this case, we have memory instead of well, fuel instead of memory, right? And so the air traffic controller is staying in contact with each object via the radio, uh, the same way the JVM keeps a reference to an object. When the, when the JVM still maintains a reference to an object, like a plane in the air, staying in constant radio contact with the tower, you know that this plane still doing, uh, this object is still performing its assigned task. Now, when the plane lands, it's finished its task, the radio signal is gonna drop. And now the JVM knows that this plane has a resource that can be reallocated for new planes that are going to be asked to go perform their task. So, I mean, there's obviously more complexity involved, um, but there's one thing I'll throw in here. And this is a question you can ask that, you know, can a developer forcibly remove an object from memory? And you might get them to say, oh yeah, there's a system command like system.gc or runtime.gc. But if they say that that's how you can, a developer can control garbage collection, wrong. They cannot, control garbage collection. They just serve as suggestions. So I'd love to see if anyone on this call makes use of that question. And, and managers, you know, don't always understand what you need to actually do your job. I mean, they often give buzzwords as a blueprint. They confuse the description with actual requirements. And you need to drive the conversation to really unearth the questions that you need to qualify um, the candidate. And, and um, you know, so customize the interviews by, is by asking the right questions on the intake call and focus on deliverables, not skills, in the buzzwords that you see all over the description. And the questions you're asking have to uncover the competencies that are going to be necessary to support a, a record you're, that you're working on. And, and knowing the answer to the question simply isn't enough. So I recommend ask a manager to pick a deliverable that you're going to ask this candidate to produce and what questions can I ask that will determine conclusively if this person actually has the competencies to do the work? And then tell us, what does this person's answer tell us about their, what does it tell us about their knowledge, right? And, and, and getting the manager's perspective is always critical. Ask them what questions they like to ask. And don't just ask for what the answer is. Find out what it means to the manager. What does it mean that this person knows or doesn't know um, this subject? What does it mean if they can't answer the question? And I want to wrap up by giving you a, a, another lightweight methodology I came up with. It's called work. And this is intended to frame the job intake call so you can get the information that's most relevant to the work that this manager is going to actually put on someone's plate. And work is just an acronym. You know, so if you're hiring manager, they don't always understand what information the recruiters need. They absolutely confuse job descriptions with requirements. Um, and, and the requirement is not simply based on a bunch of languages and protocols that you're gonna see in a job description. And they've been so used to working with HR and, they, and they're used to thinking of 
job description is distilling technical terms like they were handing out items on a recipe and you need to go and educate the manager what you need to actually effectively do your job and the, and the work methodology is a great way to do it and so the the work the w of work there's three w's right what are you building and what business process or workflow is being supported by this work what deliverable will you ask a candidate to hit, say, in the first 90 days of the project? And what question can we ask that will validate that this candidate can produce this work artifact? The O of work, what objective are you targeting on this project and the business outcome you're expecting? Now, keep in mind, we haven't gotten to anything that relates to technology until we get to R. Identify the technical requirements that come with this role and how do they relate to the deliverables? And then the K of work, can you quantify the keys that would separate two or more equally qualified candidates? Now, if you can get a manager in an intake call just focused on these six questions, you will walk away with everything the recruiter needs to be able to target the right people and ask the right questions and extract the right knowledge from the candidate who's being asked to produce this body of work. So uh, I know I, I left us a little bit short on time, Venkat, but uh, I would gladly take any questions anyone had. Sure. Um, I think Mark, somebody just asked if you can go back to the three W's. Uh, can you just yes. go one second back? Yep. Um, uh, and also, and just uh, also, um, to all the listeners here, if you have any questions, there is uh, a section called Q&A. So please go ahead and type in your question and I will read that question across to Mark and uh, okay. Mark can answer that. Um, I think if you can just walk through all the three W's again, I think that's what yes. uh, someone- Yes, absolutely. Did. Okay, so, so you're gonna want to give a good clear description of what your candidate is gonna be asked to do. And you're doing this for a couple of reasons. Number one, you want clarity for yourself to understand what's being built. But the other thing too, and if you look through job descriptions, especially ones that are posted by agencies, they're just reposting of the, of the um, job description itself. And the candidates aren't really attracted to it because it's just a pile of buzzwords. But if your job descriptions can lead with, this is what you're gonna be building, this is who it's for. This is how they're using it. This is this is the the, the problem um, you're going to be solving. Your job descriptors are, are going to pop more. It's going to get the candidate more interested because they're they care about the work and how is it going to improve my marketability. What am I going to learn that I don't know right now? And then by asking the specific deliverable, this is where you're defining. Because let's say you have a job description that has 15 buzzwords on it. And the manager describes, this is deliverable. I'm going to put in their plate in the first 90 days. If they can't answer this question, who cares if they have two or more years of Angular 6.0? It just doesn't matter. And then the question is like, okay, great. Here's a deliverable. Now, what question can we ask that will absolutely rule them in or out as to whether or not they produce this work. If this was the only question you asked on a job intake call, you would have at least enough to, ver to verify someone has the walking around knowledge and ability to describe that, you know, to, that is tied directly to a deliverable that's gonna be put on their plate if they get hired to do this work. Perfect. Does that make sense? Thank you, Mark. Um, I'm just going to move on to the next question here. Yes. This next question I have here is, uh, whenever I ask technical questions to candidates, they are used to giving excuses as they are good in implementing the things practically, but not <laughs> confident on theory part. How, yep. how we could find out that this person is a right foot or not? Okay. Well, I would, uh, I, I, that's a fair question, but I would, always relate back to, and if you can start doing your job intake calls that are focused on deliverables, um, asking them questions that relates to their ability to explain how they can produce those things, you know, you're, you almost, you know, you know, ruling them out because if, if they're not willing or able to 
answer your question directly with the specifics you require and they want to talk about you know theoretical things and you know just i would just say like look so i, I hear you but all i'm all i'm trying to get at is like this is what the hiring manager explained to us that you're going to be asked to produce this say in the first three months of the project i just need to hear you explain situations where you've built something similar to that and so by having sort of that approach and not letting the tail wag the dog, by letting the, the candidate determine what, what information they would like to share, by having this approach, this game plan, it's going to keep you focused on something the manager is going to ask them to do. So if they're unwilling or unable to simply respond to the question as asked, I'd say you could use that as a, as a parameter to, as to whether or not you even want to consider them for the um, submittal. Now, I know everyone's tracking their KPIs. They want to make as many subs as possible, but subs that don't go anywhere just produce a negative 100% ROI on the time it took to get to that point. Right, yep. Good. Um, I think we have that. Um, also, um, I think the next question I have here is, what is the best advice you can give to a brand new technical recruiter that has no technical experience being thrown into working into a high-end technical role? Okay, so the, the probably the easiest thing to do was to um, be completely transparent and, and say to the person, so let's say you're talking to some Java developer who's got you know 10 plus years of experience and to say, hey, listen, I'm really excited to be working with you. I'm new to the space. I'm not technical. So when I ask you questions, I, I may ask you some follow-ups, but it's only because I want to understand what you do because I want to, I need to be related to somebody else. So I'm relying on you to be able to explain to me and break it down in a way that I can digest it so I can represent you more effectively. And, and so when you, when you put it to them like that to say, hey, look, I'm not going to pretend I'm a veteran recruiter. I'm not going to pretend that I have all this technical knowledge, even though a lot of my peers may be very experienced and the, my employer has been in business for, for decades. But me personally, I just need you to uh, understand that I'm going to need probably more clarity and explanation. So I really want you to be able, I want to be able to represent you as effectively as possible. So I'm I may have some additional questions and clarification, so I hope you're okay with that. Because if you ask a person for help, they're generally willing to give it. But as long as you, you're transparent about it and tell them what you need and, and make sure they understand you need the explanation that you can internalize so you can explain it to somebody else, it increases their chances of being able to represent you effectively instead of just being cowed by the fact that, wow, this person's got 15 years in the business and I'm in month two and holy cow, we're, we're so on, on even planes. But right. they're hoping you help them find a, their next gig. So they do need to work with you. So I, I'd say take that approach. Good, thanks, Mark. I have a couple more questions here. Yes. Um, question I have here is, any technical resources that you would suggest new tech recruiters to use to expand knowledge? Uh, well, um, um, as I, I don't want to um, put on a different hat here, but we obviously um, uh, do quite a bit to help educate recruiters on understanding technical uh, subjects as it applies to their job. Um, but you know the, the learning that you go through is an ongoing thing. Um, I, I would recommend that you you know check out um, different um, different technical blogs that uh, are of subjects that you want to be you know kept in the loop on. Um, you know you can't make it a full time occupation just to you know listen to podcasts and and, and read blogs. But I would take every opportunity you can when you're having a conversation with the candidate and just get them to explain little bits and pieces here and there because until you can internalize a bit of information it's hard to make use of it in the in the execution of your job and so whenever you have the opportunity and when i was coming up when i went through my process 
I made a nuisance of myself. I would get colleagues to like pull them aside and make me uh, whiteboard stuff out um, and explain things. And so, and because you don't have the time or human capacity to just take in an ocean of information and be able to make actionable use of it, I'd say cherry pick your opportunities when you're interfacing with an engineer to ask them questions like, so, so what is a web service? Like, give me a high level understanding and pretend you're explaining to my aunt or, or to your aunt, right? And just take those opportunities to grab bits of knowledge, but ask them to do it in a way that is intended to be delivered to a non-technical audience. Because if you say, hey, well, tell me what web services are, they might instinctively just give the, the, the very detailed technical explanation, but ask them to say, hey, if I were going to explain what a web service is to my aunt, like, how would I do that? And so... That's just a probably an asynchronous way that you could sort of apply those little, you know, take advantage of those little opportunities when you're interacting with technologists. And over time, through osmosis, you're going to start internalizing this stuff in, in a way that you could wield it from the hip and make it part of the way you interact with and have conversation with candidates. Thank you, Mark. I think we have one last question here before yes. we wrap up. Um, some candidates give technical verbal interview, but when asked questions for practical or coding test, they're not ready to give that. Uh, right. They excuse this all the time. Um, so how to judge candidates initial stage, uh, whether they are ready to take a coding exam or not? Okay. Well, um, the mere fact that they're reluctant to subject themselves to a coding exercise is, is a flag all by itself. But, um, I, I would ask them if they show some hesitance to take a coding exercise and I would just ask, I'd dig in and say, say, is there, have you had a particularly bad experience with a coding exercise or do you feel you need an inordinate amount of preparation before you feel you'd be ready? Help me understand the reluctance behind wanting to, like if our client wants you to take a coding exercise, help me understand more about what's causing you to not be willing to just jump into the fray and make them explain themselves. And if they're, if they're giving you a really wishy-washy answer, you're probably getting the answer. They go, okay, maybe this guy's not the one despite this great resume. And then yeah. you'll have a disappointing result. But, in it, but if they give you a really concrete answer and say, yeah, I've actually had a couple of you know, coding exercises where um, the, thing, the, the thing either didn't work or it had nothing to do with the work that was described to me, and I thought it was a big waste of time, or I know for a fact that these things carry with them all kinds of unintentional biases that, um, that I think don't reflect how things happen in the real world. So I, I don't think it's a good use of my time because I've seen firsthand that they give you know, indeterminate results and I don't think it's a good use of my time. At least if they articulate a well-founded reason based on real life experiences, it sounds a little bit more credible than just saying, I don't want to take it, I'm not ready. Or can I do it next week? Right. You know, they're, they're, they're helping you qualify them out because you know, they, can't be, they can't run from coding if they were actually given the job. Yes, yes. Thanks, Mark. Uh, I have one last question. I think this is an interesting yes. question before uh, we wrap up. Um, based on your expertise, if the recruiter determines that the candidate is only 80% technically qualified, is she worth or he worth submitting to the client? How do you fill the other 20% to satisfy the requirement? Yep. So, so the short that. the short answer, the short answer is yes, that they absolutely would be worth it. But if there was anything about the candidates makeup or their knowledge that you made you a little suspicious, I would point that out. I would lead with that and say, okay, Mr. Manager, I found this person. I was really excited about when, before we spoke and the conversation went pretty well. Here are two areas of concern I have and here's what they were and here's why I think they might be a problem. So you might want to consider digging in that area really deeply just to validate if I was correct or if it was, I just made the incorrect assumption and the person was perfectly fine. And so if you're pointing it out, the manager will not only appreciate the fact that you were able to highlight this, this one area that could be um, maybe a, a shortcoming or a weakness, 
then they will redirect their efforts to really validate if this is a problem. And then they will at least appreciate the fact that you took note of it, you flagged it for them in advance, and then you gave them an area of interrogation to actually validate that. So I think that would be a tremendous thing for you to build credibility with the manager. Because even if the, so let's say the manager agreed with you, now your word means so much more to them because you flagged out what could be a shortcoming and the manager validates that your word is just uh, carries more weight now just because you took the time to do that. Perfect. Perfect. Um, I think um, those are all the questions we had, Mark. I know we are um, at the mark. Again, yep. um, uh, thank you very much, Mark, for taking time to join us here on this webinar. I'm sure this is a very helpful webinar. Um, this webinar is going to be is recorded, so this is going to be available on our website uh, if you want, if you want to go and revisit again. And um, if you have any needs for uh, any recruitment, please feel free to reach out to us. If you need any hiring help, please reach out to Mark as well. Again, thank you very much uh, for taking this time. Um, I look forward to talking to you again, Mark. Ben Cott, again, thank you very much for, uh, for the invitation. And I hope you guys got a lot out of this, this talk and gave you some tactics and tools and approaches that you can apply immediately to your day-to-day -day and see some better results. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Thanks again. Thank All you right. very much. Have Thanks. Bye.